thank you for joining us. Of course, writing for all of us is a very important topic, and we're delighted to have Paul Sylvia joining us, who is the author of one of my personal favorites. Um, and just a little story, we put a short bio of Dr. Sylvia on the back of your agenda. Um, but Paul Sylvia is at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and is a quite a prolific and productive writer, and is also the PI or co-PI on three National Institutes of Health grants right now. And his re he's a social psychologist, and so his research is primarily in that area, but he has some pretty diverse interests within social psychology. And I first encountered this book as a doctoral student I think it was my second year, and uh, my advisors, Sharon Davis and Joe Tamaka, who's here, um, were, I think, about ready to wring their hands and say, we give up. <laughs> She's been stuck on this paper for too long. And I, I had one particular paper that, um, where I had one of those writing blocks that we've all had at some point or another. And one day, Sharon basically said, you know, Joe and I have tried everything we can think of. You haven't made the kind of progress we'd like to see on this, and I don't know what else to do. Somebody recommended this book to me, and she had it. She said, I haven't read it yet. but. Um, but I think you need to read it, because I don't know what else to tell you. You need to get past this stumbling block. And so I read Paul's book, and um, I don't know if it was coincidence. I'm going to attribute it to the book, because it was very motivating and had some pretty concrete strategies that enabled me to finish my paper. But the next month, I submitted four manuscripts. And um, so, and three of them ended up getting published. So <laughs> I'm going to say I owe a lot to this book. And uh, I found it very interesting and very motivating. And um, with that, I'm going to let Paul share his tips for writing, and we're just absolutely thrilled that he flew all the way from North Carolina to join us here in El Paso today. So thanks Great. again, and welcome, Paul. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Cool. So first, thanks, everyone, for coming on a Friday, because we are all here at sort of an early time on a Friday, and I know everyone's kind of committed to, to spend a lot of time here. And it's not fun time, it's time talking about writing, so it's grim time. <laughs> but first, thanks for Holly also for inviting me and working it out, because if you've ever organized things like this, it takes way more work than it looks, so certainly thank you. So, so we have about four hours today to cover broad and multifarious aspects of, of writing and publishing and grant writing and there's a lot of stuff on the agenda. It's roughly split into four things. I will say though, we're not super committed to the time and I encourage everyone to go crazy with the questions. So, because partly it would just be sort of strange to like be here for like four hours and not get something answered. <laughs> so if there's like anything you want to know, just hit me. Yes. Excellent. Started, but I'm going to you. Um, Perfect. I just want to let you all know that one of the, one of the things that Paul's going to be talking about after lunch is mm -hmm. productive writing. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Mena, Christina Mena from UC Houston, is one of the co directors of the Community Engagement Corps. And she and Sharon Davis and I are going to be helping and supporting anybody that wants to, to do their writing. Mm -hmm. So, for those of you who are interested, and we will be um, following mm -hmm. up with you and doing some things that will hopefully be helpful in supporting your writing group. So, please feel free to talk to me or Christy about Definitely. how to come in and going after. Definitely. And certainly, um, don't think of it as interruptions. As you shall see, this is not one of those like grim death marches through the <laughs> valley of bullet points. We've all been there. It's sort of more free form, so don't feel like you're interrupting anything. Just speak up, wave. If you've managed to like hold off on any of those strawberries in the back, just toss it. I'll catch it. My mouth is, you know, whatever. Wave a knife, throw it. Cool. We're in business. Now, the first thing we're going to start about, though, is all the things we're covering today. I think the first thing is really the core of it all for me, <laughs> and I think for everyone, right? So, if you think of how to write a lot, I think this is sort of the motivational aspect of writing, the motivational struggle of writing. This is, this is the hitch for people. Like, when people are struggling with writing, it's that it's hard to do all of this and still maintain a life. Now, it's, it's very easy to write a lot and not have a life. You can just sort of do what maybe like the stereotypical professors of old did, which was don't get married, don't have kids, don't get sick, <laughs> don't do any service, don't spend time with your grad students, become like a dark, embittered, thwarted man, and, or well, it's usually men in the old days, I would say. I'm sort of, I have this vision of the 60s, actually. Um, those days are really like behind us, not that there aren't like dark and thwarted, bitter people and academics, of course. But this is not what we aspire to. Like, no one wants to get into this biz so they can just lock themselves in a little cabin <laughs> and write their specific aims page. Like, the hope is that we can 
be productive with our writing without letting it dominate our lives. And so I think this is kind of the core thing. So we're going to talk a bit about this. And it kind of comes from like my lens in psychology and just some sort of ways to do it that are maybe helpful. Because I think if people can't get some kind of control over the writing and just sort of like wrangle it into some sort of shape so it fits into their life, really nothing else is really going to help. And people can end up writing a lot in a way where they just kind of feel like dominated and controlled and they always feel like the dark scowling face of their advisor the back of their heads because like for some of you who are sitting here your advisor is probably actually scowling behind you like right in your back so yeah so it's not it's not all in your head you know it's not all in your head now before we get started just to kind of see where everyone's at so we have I guess who here is in graduate school Woo! <laughs> Usually you would, you would expect them to be more clustered by the food, but I guess that's just the way it works. Um, who here is in like, say, postdoctoral land? Anybody? A couple people? Cool. Who's in like assistant professor land? And who here is in some other land? <laughs> cool. Excellent. A few refugees, perhaps. Great. So, yeah, so I think a lot of people are all in the same the same grim spot. Cool. So, yeah, so my outlook on writing is, <laughs> you know, as psychologists, of course, we come bearing messages of discouragement and despair. <laughs> and this is my own kind of sense. Like, my, my worldview on writing is that it's sort of hard and frustrating. And I sort of, I sort of mean it. I think it's always, we have some psychologists in the room, certainly, but psychologists do have a deservedly bad reputation for thinking that everything is in people's heads. And if you can just, because like culture and institutions and neighborhoods and politics, this doesn't matter. You just have to change the way you think about it, and then you'll be happy. And yeah, and this is, I think, unrealistic and unfair, and really a source of like a lot of suffering because when people struggle with writing, like with this or anything else, they think, wow, some people are doing a lot of it. They must not be struggling. Like, what is it that they're knowing or thinking that I'm not doing? And I think it's okay to just say writing's sort of hard and discouraging. It can get less hard and less discouraging. <laughs> I'll tell you, it actually still sort of stays kind of hard and discouraging, which is maybe not something you want to hear, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like okay. It's okay to just sort of say that's where we're at. So, like when you start, you're mostly trying to struggle with getting that first thing written, you know, your thesis or your first manuscript. That kind of gets easier, but then you get invited to write book chapters, you get invited to contribute things you've never written before, then maybe it's time for your first small grant, then maybe it's time for your first bigger grant, and then you end up at a point where maybe you're working with a lot of people and there's so much more to write than there ever was before, because now you're that scowling advisor in the back. and. You know, it's, it's really more of a lifespan thing. Like the challenges shift and change. They're always going to be there. It's okay. I think it's okay if it's not something people ever feel really great about because there's so much stuff that we're good at and do really well that we don't feel great about. And it's just, it's kind of okay. It's kind of okay. But understanding why maybe it's like so frustrating, <laughs> discouraging is maybe key to figuring out like what you can do about it because it can be much less stressful than it is now. It's still something people can do well. And my sense of why it's discouraging is a few things. The first is that this is like very competitive. Like it's competitive in the sense that we're not just trying to write something that we can publish somewhere. Although some of us in the assistant professor boat might be thinking, actually, I'm, I'm really just trying to publish something somewhere. <laughs> it's third year review time, you know. So beyond that, you know, thinking more broadly, like that's, that's not that all we're aspiring to do all the time, right? We're trying to do work that we care about. We're trying to do work that sort of shifts some conversation. And when you start out in any domain of science, like you're the young person and there's like the established people. And you're trying to like get your message out to people who are already established. And you're just, you do this stuff because you care and you're trying to do something that that matters and whenever you're trying to do anything kind of at the edge of your abilities it's going to be kind of hard. But I would say that beyond that one of the reasons why it's discouraging is anyone here read PhD comics? It's okay you can admit it. You can admit it. It's, it's the single greatest procrastination tool available <laughs> to graduate students. So 
the, yeah, this is, let's just say the training of writing in graduate school is, well, suboptimal, we might say, <laughs> euphemistically. This, um, this one really kind of hit home. I saw this, I was like, oh, I have to forward it to my graduate students. And then they were like, that was really creepy that you sent that to us. We're not sure what you're trying to get across there. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I understand. Yeah, this was sort of my own grad school experience. It's like a running joke because it is sort of true. Very few places have a semester-long class on academic writing and publishing. It's, it's just one of these things. And I think, I'm not sure why it is. I think part of it is that maybe often this is kind of trivialized as that's a skills class as opposed to a substantive class, um, which I think kind of misses the whole point that if you don't have that skill, there ain't going to be any substance. Like someone's got to write this business up so that we can have these long, drawn out, overly technical seminars on substantive issues. And I think it's also that, and like this weird, like intergenerational transmission of despair, like a lot of professors just don't feel good about writing. So they don't feel good about teaching class about writing. So their students don't feel good about writing, who then become professors and perpetuate this dark cycle of just feeling horrible about your writing. And this makes it really hard. And I think um, it's made quite a bit harder for people who are coming back into academics. Like I know it's pretty common in all of our fields. People will come back from working in public health, working in nursing, working in education, just kind of working in the trenches of community mental health, come back into academics it's been a long time since people had to do this sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it really, I mean, it really has been. And it's, I think it's just a, it's something hopefully we all in the long term can be much better at. Like where I work, we only just now started a semester long graduate class. And I was like, to my chair, I was like, it's kind of embarrassing to me that we don't have this. He's like, we're just understaffed, we can't do it. I'm like, Argh. but yeah. But I would say that the other reason the reason that is raised more than any other reason is that it's very hard to find time to write. Because people have lives or they're trying to carve out some semblance of a life and it's hard, right? People have real lives. And we're not just talking hobbies here. People have kids, they have health problems. Like I think much of, much of the model for grad school and academics comes from this time that probably never existed where Nobody had kids, nobody had health problems, nobody got deployed, nobody was caring for kids and grandparents. Everyone went four years in high school and four years in college and then four years in grad school and then just went right into the job. And this is just not realistic. Like, it's natural to feel stretched for time because life is largely crazy. And so you hear this more than, than anything else. It's made worse by the fact that the kinds of jobs we all have are there's a lot of structure and a lot of observation when it comes to things like teaching and service, but almost none with writing. Like you could go a long time without working on your writing, the dean would never know, right? <laughs> I was at a, a conference once, and people, after like drinking too much, as is their want, <laughs> right? So people were just getting into this old high school thing of like, if you like died alone in your house, how long would it take people to know you're dead? <laughs> Morbid. But this is psychology, right? We're somewhat bent. So, and one of the people said, if it was a teaching day, it would be about two hours. And I was like, yeah, actually that's true. Because like think of how, how seriously like the teaching part of the job's taken. Like if you're supposed to teach a class, so imagine you didn't tell the class ahead of time you wouldn't be there. You didn't tell the front office. You didn't tell your friends around the department, didn't leave a sign, didn't send something out over the internet, you just didn't show up. And the students sort of sit there, kind of creeped out and spooked. How could we ever learn? And <laughs> like it probably would be about two to three hours before like they send like the fire department or the police just to kind of do a, a wellness check at your house. Um, it happened actually where someone, someone I know where they work, it happened, it was about an hour and a half. Because like like that is how seriously the teaching is taken and sort of naturally so, right? Like we get all kinds of weird service. You're less involved in this in grad school, but once you enter 
the, the hallowed ranks of the faculty. You get asked to be on the Associate Vice Provost for Parking Services, Parking Utilization Committee, <laughs> because this is, parking would collapse without faculty input into the pressing <laughs> issues of the day. And you're like, if I say no, I'm gonna be blackballed for life. Because <laughs> you don't mess with a parking provost. So you just kind of get sucked into all kinds of weird craziness that you suspect you should say no to, but you're not sure how. <laughs> and if you don't do that, they notice. Like, it's not quite like teaching, but you just, they have this euphemism, you need, you know, departmental citizenship, which means we, the people with the authority, are just going to ask you to do stuff and really expect you to say yes, because we would like your help. Because we need to say that we did a lot, and we do that by saying that the people we manage did a lot of stuff. So, so this is like just the way it is, right? Not to come across as cynical, but like when you, you take that as your anchor, like what's up with the writing? Like so if you're working on a thesis or working on a grant proposal and you just flake, I mean, like seriously the fire department's not gonna knock on your door. You're not gonna see all these like really like beefed up firefighters saying, how's the writing going? We heard, we heard you hadn't finished your significant aims page. It's been three weeks. We just wanted to check. Like, oh, I'm glad you're okay, but man, your colleagues were worried. Like, it's just not gonna happen. Like, they will check in on you once a year, sort of, in the tenure track world. Like, there will be a third year review in like, your fifth or sixth year P and T time. They really have a look. It's amazing how long they will let people sink before they check to see if they are swimming. And so, what this means is it really it has to be much more on us. Like, this is you know taken in light of the fact that people didn't get good training in it. It's hard to find time to do it. And it's not something that's like institutionally reinforced or institutionally carved out. And if anything, the messages are really mixed about like how important writing is. We need to do something. And this is, of course, where psychologists and the health professions come into mind. There are many ways to change behavior. This is, um, I have a, I have a kind of a, an unhealthy interest in really ancient ads for like related to behavior modification and behavior change and particularly psychopharmacology. They might still sell these on eBay if you have kids. Um, but yeah, so changing behavior, there are many ways to do it. And this is the kind of, you know, we can think about writing this way. We can think about writing as any other kind of struggle. If you can kind of figure out the root of it, you can kind of get some ideas about maybe some productive ways to do it. And this interests me a lot because I'm a social psychologist, but my main interest is really in motivation and emotion. And these kinds of struggles are really interesting to motivational psychology because in some ways procrastination and perfectionism are really fascinating. Like whenever people have a goal that's really important and there's a lot riding on it, but nothing's happening, this is just kind of cool and a little morbid. A little gossipy. So this is kind of my way of sort of thinking about it. Now I know being here, being here in Texas, when you see this, you naturally are thinking, that must be the three things that Rick Perry was planning on cutting. <laughs> I, I will tell you, I, I'm sort of like political junkie. And when he started listing like the three things he was going to cut, and he got hung up on two, I'm like, don't let the third be the Department of Health and Human Services. <laughs> <laughs> we, we really need NIH. So fortunately, he just, you know, he was struck by lightning. Um, or I think it was more just the mental signals of thousands and thousands of health sciences researchers saying, don't cut DHSS. <laughs> need those guys. But no, rather, these are, if you were to like crudely reduce all of the complexity of human motivation into sort of three things, which is something that psychologists are really good at, and just take all the texture out of human action. These would be sort of like the three, the three main mechanisms of how stuff happens. And we have impulse, and we have willpower, and we have habit. And so these are, the rock, paper, scissors is a little apt because these do kind of compete against each other in some sort of dark contest of sorts. And in terms of writing, you can think of these as the three ways that people approach their writing, and the three ways that academic writing tends to happen. And you can sort of guess 
a couple of these ways are not quite as good as another way, but they will all maybe sound a little bit familiar. And our first, of course, is impulse and impulsiveness. Now, impulsiveness gets a bit of a bad reputation, particularly in the public health world and all of the health sciences, because when you hear about impulsiveness, it's usually connected close to the word adolescence and then connected to something like substance abuse, teen pregnancy, violence, and all the other kinds of dark things, like buying early 90s Acura Integras and putting those huge coffee can fart sounding machines on the back, you know? <laughs> That's impulsiveness. And so, but impulsiveness is actually very important in human motivation, I'll just say, because uh, if you only ever did what you planned to do, you would miss out on a lot of rewarding things in life. Like, you would almost never make friends. It's important to be open to reward. For writing, what this looks like, this looks like when people are waiting to feel like writing. So this is like the sparkly, shiny, like, look at the pony kind of side of human motivation. Like, like you wait till you feel like it, and then in some absorbed kind of eyebrow singeing flash of writing, you might spend six hours writing, and it turned out really great, and you're happy. And the only reason why this is sort of bad is because you can wait a really, really, really long time to feel like writing. Really long, because it's something that's frustrating that we're not as good at as we could be. And it's, in a sense, it's a lot like gambling, and that the problem with gambling, it's not that you never win, because then gambling would be a problem. It's that you sometimes win. You don't know when it's going to be. And so you get the, the occasional random time where you feel really good about your writing, and you do strangely feel like writing. You get so much done on your thesis. And then the next day, you don't feel so good about your writing. And so you're going to wait. And you're going to wait. And you sort of are left with this sense that people who are writing a lot, they're sort of just special, that they must feel like it more. And you just it, you feel discouraged. So the f waiting until you feel like writing, it's not a super common strategy, I think, because I think most people realize that it's not going to get it done. And it's a recipe for, for total despair. The most common, without a doubt, is willpower. Like, this is how, frankly, most theses get written, most dissertations get written, because those things have deadlines. And you kind of got to finish that thing to take a job or to take an offer into a PhD program. Like, these things are just, yeah, I, I see a nudge happening here. I'm like, these are in the have to happen phase, but there, this is also how manuscripts get done. I would say this is how like 90% of all grant proposals get done because grant proposals have deadlines too. And we professors don't like do very well with managing our own time. So the deadline is important. And the willpower writing is when you're like, okay, this thing's coming up. I better wait and think about it. And if it's this time of year, it's like, it's finals week. I'm really busy. And in a subtle and sublime form of procrastination, you know what? It would actually save time if I didn't try that this week. Because in two weeks, it's summer. All right, in summer, we're going to do it. And then, like, then it's two weeks. And like, wait a second. It, I don't actually have more free time than I thought. It's really nice outside. Everyone else is like taking a vacation up to the Badlands. So I'll wait another week. Because after vacation, I'll have the ment I'll just feel refreshed. I'll have the mental space. So it really is more efficient. If you do, you could even do like the sort of calculus optimization analysis that if you think, well, it takes time, but the mental energy goes up. But eventually, you know, we run out of tricks to fool ourselves. The deadline's coming. The advisorly hounding reaches a fever pitch. Um, you finally regret like friending them on Facebook. And you're like, okay. <laughs> it's like, Argh. So this is, then it starts to get like, people get into like Super Bowl sort of final four, like semifinals kind of thing where people are like, all right, team, let's do this thing. It's got to happen. And people sort of psych themselves up, and they just, this is like the binge writing time. Like, people are just like, it's going to happen. This is the week I'm going to write the thesis. And they, like, you know, take the battery out of the phone. They send their kids off to camp, and they just work in this crazy, depressing, <laughs> discouraging binge. <laughs> over and, and then it happens, and it's done. And people are sort of not that happy because it's not the happiness of like the job well done. It's like the relief of the long deferred goal finished. And they're burned out. And that's kind of how that happens. Like that's really 
the willpower approach to writing. There's someone who actually most of you would probably know her work who told me about how she writes. She's very well known um, in sort of health psychology. And she's telling me how she, she works on stuff that's really big, like important articles and proposals. And she said that it's like, well, so I plan for it, so it's the weekend. And then I go to Costco and I buy a flat of bottled water. And I get one of those big Costco sized boxes of Cliff Bars and one of those big, like, five pound um, tangelos. Like, they're not oranges, they're not tangerines, they're some freakish genetic hybrid. And she, like, goes up into the attic because the attic's, like, finished and she has writing space there. And she, like, spends the whole weekend there. And then <laughs> I'm just sort of like, I'm sort of nodding, but thinking, like, this sounds creepy, you know? <laughs> but in graduate school, you do develop highly honed abilities of thoughtful nodding, like this kind of implacable, like, yeah, OK. <laughs> hmm. 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 I'm just like thinking, scary person. Because I just had this, this image of her like descending Monday morning, like sweaty and bedraggled, like, the R21 is finished. And like her, her son and husband just sort of like, hey, mom, you're back. And if it has, um, if there's any jazz history fans, this, it sounds like exactly like, like this is how Miles Davis quit heroin. His dad locked him up in the attic. <laughs> there was much wailing and gnashing of teeth. He comes down, he's like, all right, let's get Bird and McCoy tying her out. It's time to jam. But like, so this sounds like kind of familiar. Like this is how I wrote my master's thesis. Like the data were done early. It was like January and I was like, you know, summer would be a great time to write this <laughs> because I could collect data during the semester instead. And then summertime comes, it's like, you know, in July, my roommate's going to Colorado for a week. I can write it then. And I did. And at the time, I thought that this was cool because I wrote my thesis in a week. But really, I wrote it in seven months. It was just six months of not writing it. And then one crazy week <laughs> of just like crashing through the thing. And you know how it goes. Now, you can really write a lot this way. We all know a lot of people write a lot of this way. I know a lot of people with a lot of grants. This is how they do their grants. And they all have these slightly sad stories that are funny in some ways, but then sad on reflection of the old days when you couldn't submit, you could submit grants in hard copy to NIH. And where I live, it's a five hour drive from Bethesda where you turn in NIH grant. Yeah, yeah, see the old timers, we all remember these because yeah, this, this, yeah, and it's, um, you send that grad student on the overnight train to hand these things in in person. And everyone has tales, like, like all of the, the old school researchers, they know where the 24 hour FedEx hub is. They know. And these are funny stories, but at the same time, you start to listen to them like stories of frat guys talking about their latest episode of binge drinking. It's like, a, dude, I was so wasted. And it's sort of like that, because you're like, you know, the NIH deadlines, they never change. <laughs> They're up on the internet in perpetuity. Like, you could have seen this coming. And this takes us to our third, the most humble, the least sexy habit. Right, this is not the part of motivation that gets a lot of attention. It is very rarely paired with either adolescence or substance abuse or teen pregnancy. Although it could, if it tried. So this is not the glamour side of motivation. You know, this is sort of the, um, it's like the socks with Birkenstocks kind of side of motivation. <laughs> and not those kinds of like cool, you know, kind of Austin farmer's market, free trade, hand knitted organic cotton socks where you want to like touch and rub the fabric. It's just more like, you know, socks you get at Target. It's just, so this is, this is the part of motivation that there's really not a lot of work on because it's, easy and obvious, but this is the kind of motivation that gets it done. So willpower is strong and impulse is strong, but habit is patient and implacable, and it always <laughs> wins. And you see how it always wins when you're working in public health context, in any kind of health context, and behavior change context, when you're confronted with the bad habits. And we only really ever think about habits when we think of bad habits, and we see Man, these are seriously resistant to change. Like, it is hard to work with bad habits. These are things why smoking cessation is so hard. I mean, there's the physical addiction part, 
but it's embedded in, yeah, it's embedded in like this daily ritual. It's embedded in a friendship and peer network. There's just times when people smoke, times and places when people smoke. And habits are, are fiendish. So in motivation science, we don't, like we, people tend to think of habits as these, these passive things, like you just get in this rut, this habit is just something that develops. But habits, we tend to think of like these active mental systems that are vigilant and they're always looking and they're looking to see is it the time for this? Is it the place for this? And is the stuff for this around? And when it is, what your habit does is it mentally inhibits other goals that you could do at the time and it starts to activate the goal associated with the habit and the things that would further that goal. This is why habits are nefarious and this is why bad habits are so hard to break. Because like, I usually smoke a cigarette this time. There's my friend who likes to smoke cigarettes. Oh, there's coffee. Here's the place where we always smoke. And what your habit is doing is saying, smoke, lighter, cigarettes, mmm. Other things you could do instead, like eat fruit and granola, inhibited. <laughs> and it's, it's tough, it's tough to break. But this is why also in like a lot of public health and sort of health behavior change, this is why habits can be utilized for good rather than evil. That if you, can, if you can build a really good habit, it can also be one of these evil, implacable, good habits. You can sort of habitualize behavior so that you don't want to do it, or you don't not want to do it. You just sort of A, want it. It's just something that you do. So you kind of see where all this is going. Come on, Antony, don't be shy. Um, yeah, after a while, it's just seats in the front. <laughs> seats in the front. I will just say, in passing, this is one of the few great privileges of not being a student anymore, is everyone likes to sit in the back. And professors make fun of their undergraduates for always sitting in the back. But I always sit in the back when I can. So just want to get that out there. So anyway, so, so with habits and writing, you can think of this as, so writing, it's hard. It's painful, you don't like it, you don't feel like doing it, there's no time for it, it's a job for habit. And this is something that experienced writers do a lot. Like this is what professional writers who are like have to like write to you know, make money and eat do. And this is what a lot of successful academic writers do. And this is sort of the simple world of writing schedules and planned writing where the reason why you would consider making a writing schedule where you just pick out some times for writing and then you always write there is not so much that it creates time for writing, but that's obviously a big part of it. The real reason why this works is that after a couple weeks, writing becomes habitual. And you're not forcing yourself to do it. You're not starting the day thinking, is there time today for write? So if I can write, I'll just keep an eye open and see if there is. You're not waiting to feel like writing. It's just part of a routine that happens, kind of rain or shine, whether you really feel like it or not. And the way to do it, I think, is to treat it like a class. Because I think we have good mental models for our classes. We take them extremely seriously. And they're often four to six hours a week, which is like a lot of time to write in a week, which is fantastic. And we can kind of fit that in. So you think, OK, I'm going to make my own little writing class. This will be the worst class ever. <laughs> like, way worse than hierarchical linear modeling. Which is I don't really mean that. It's actually extremely important, Eric. And you should all take it. <laughs> Very important. Don't get the wrong message. Just for the cameras there. Important. So, anyway, so four to six hours. So, four to six hours. And you will write during that time. And that's kind of it for the most part. Like, that's sort of the basic sort of message. And you, you pick these times. And if you pick times that are reasonable and defensible, after a couple weeks, this will be a very tight habit. You can sort of see this in your mind, like if you're teaching and taking classes. You can see this at the start of a semester. Your mind is all messed up with your schedule because you barely remember what you're taking, the rooms it's in, the times they're at. You actually have to look at your calendar and look at your schedule. I occasionally show up at the wrong day and time for a class. <laughs> I am momentarily like so righteously angry that none of the students showed up. And then I'm like slowly slink away in shame that it's Tuesday rather than Wednesday. And, um, but after a couple weeks, you know, what happens is you got it. 
And if you can introspect a moment about what your brain is doing, so like at the start of the semester, like I'm teaching a 12.30 class, like I scheduled a lunch for somebody at 12. And then I had to cancel because like, crap, I'm teaching, right? But after a couple weeks, your habits have taken over and that they're, they're inhibiting all of that stuff. So on a Tuesday, it never occurs to me to go out for lunch with somebody. A Wednesday, or I'm not teaching, it, it does occur to me. Like, your habits are screening out alternative things that conflict with your habit. So you pick some good times, times you can defend, which means people are not going to want stuff from you, or you can hide from those people, or you can plausibly lie to those people about what you're actually doing. Because <laughs> sometimes they don't really get this whole writing according to a schedule thing. And whatever works, it could be at home, it could be off-site in a coffee shop, you could just go park your car out into a deserted patch of scrub brush. Like, whatever, like whatever's going to do it, where you can have an hour to two hours a few times a week, or an hour every day, cool. And so this will do it. Like, you'll get a very strong habit. Like, a sense of how just the way I've sort of done this over the years. So I sort of split, like, my whole writing life, as long as, like, my whole life into, like, pre-parenthood, post-parenthood. So this book, How to Write a Lot, I did, this was in this sort of misty, hazy, pre-having kids period, of which there's enough documentary evidence that I know there was a time when I was not a parent. <laughs> like those of you with kids kind of know what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't can't explain it. It's just sort of like there are photographs and videos of me and it's time to leave the house. I'm like, oh, okay. And I just grab my keys and I go to the car and leave the house. <laughs> It's really like, it's like the freaking marriage of Figaro when you have two preschoolers to get them out of the house. So anyway, so, yeah. So before I had kids, I talked about this in the book, um, I would write from 8 in the morning to 10 in the morning, Monday through Friday. And I felt at the time, already I can tell some of the students are like, yeah, 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that too is how I felt. Because I would set my alarm. I would set my alarm. And I would get up, and like the sun's out, and I would just feel like hardcore, just punk. Like I would just feel tough, like getting up at eight. Like I am committed, you know. Like, like I'm getting up at eight, eight at right. And after I write, I'm gonna go get like a barbed wire tattoo around my neck. <laughs> that's just like how tough I am. And so like, this was like great. I did this for years. It was cool. Um, then we had kids, this is my oldest, Helena, she's like four and a half. She was born in October 2007. And really that's like, I have never slept past eight since then. So it's been almost five years. It would, it's just simply not possible anymore. Like, cause you all know how parenthood is, right? It's like, um, it's like chronic <laughs> fatigue syndrome. <laughs> but, but like, yeah, it's like a very, very loud variant of chronic fatigue. <laughs> so, yeah. That one's not in the DSM yet. But anyways, ICD, <laughs> ICD 11 will have that. So, so the writing schedule from 8 to 10 did not really survive. And that just was simply too late in the day when Big Jonas kind of gets up at 5.30 and is just ready to talk about bulldozers. So, <laughs> it's changed a lot. So right now it's, they're sleeping later, so I had a period where I'd get up at five in the morning, five in the morning to 6.30, Monday through Friday. That's, you could be justified in splurging on like some knuckle tattoos <laughs> if, you, if you get up at 5.30 or five in the morning for a couple of years. That's hard. You end up going to bed very early, which is a parenthood thing anyways. So now it's more like six o'clock, six to seven. So I write actually about five hours a week. I've done this for about a year now, so six to seven. Monday through Friday, and when people hear this sort of stuff, they often think like, that's really disciplined. But it's really not. It's disciplined for a few weeks. The rest of the time, it's amotivational. It's sort of avolitional. It's just something that you do. It's a lot like, perhaps some of you are, I've met many like hardcore jogging junkies, like crazy jogging types who will go jogging every day. And I said this to one of them once too, as a grad school professor, he's like, well, it's not, 
it's not discipline. It's just, I just do it. And I've just done it for so long, it's just what I do. Even in Kansas, where in the winter it'll be like 40 degrees below zero with the wind chill, he's still out there looking like a slightly scary paramilitary guy <laughs> jogging, right? And it's, it's a similar kind of thing. Like you do anything long enough, often enough, it'll become habitual. You're not necessarily happy about it, but your habit is saying, okay, it's this time, it's the morning time, there's the coffee, there's the computer, let's do this thing. So, food for thought. Now, this is in the realm of like rampant opinions and probably has the whiff of madness about it because it's really different from how we often think about writing, which is boom and bust, you know, sort of a yo-yo dieting kind of thing. Like this is just the way writing is. We're so used to being so erratic. You know, long periods of guilt punctuated by brief periods of frenzied text. But there is like, actually intervention research on this, which is funny because there is truly research on everything. And did anyone ever run across this book, Professors as Writers by Boyce? Yeah, it's a great book. It's really, Boyce was a clinical psychologist who was um, one of these old school behavior mod guys. So behavior theory, you don't want to hear about your feelings, this kind of stuff. And he would do intervention research with professors as the participants. So he would recruit samples of professors who were seriously <laughs> stuck with their writing. And it's very easy to get samples of such professors, I'm sure. <laughs> and he would do, he did a lot of research, some cross-sectional, but toward the end he was doing a lot of essentially outcome trials, intervention outcome trials, looking at writing strategies. So this is one of my favorites. So he gets this sample of professors. He randomly assigns them to one of three groups, right? And so the first is the abstinent group, of which said professors are to be abstinent from writing, not from anything else. And they're just simply supposed to not write. So they're told emergency writing only. And I think we all know there aren't a lot of those kinds of emergencies, <laughs> right? You can, yeah. So. The other group is told to write spontaneously. So this was the impulsive approach, like write when you feel like it. If the muses descend upon you and blow into your head and you become enlivened with the fires, go crazy with it, right? But the third, this is the grim behavior theory condition. So one of Boyce's big things is to write a little bit every day. He talks about 20 minutes, like write every day for 20 minutes lot to be said for that because it's frankly 20 minutes more than most of us are writing anyways and <laughs> anyone can survive almost anything for 20 minutes and he added a contingency management layer to this so you have to write every weekday for 20 minutes and in the studies it varied what this contingency would be so sometimes it would be a punishment so you would like one of my favorites is people would have to write out a series of blank checks one for each day of the trial and if they didn't do their writing, this would be sent to some political organization that they despised. <laughs> it's pretty funny, actually, because it's not so much the $5, but it's like getting on their mailing list for the rest of your freaking natural <laughs> life. <laughs> like, hey, like, not just them, but like the whole satellite. I mean, you will get swamped, and you'll start to get really creepy solicitations. So and others, it was reward, so people could pick something that they found rewarding. And if they did their writing, they could have that reward. And in true professor fashion, the rewards were things like half a bagel or half a muffin. <laughs> and what came up surprisingly often was listen to national public radio. <laughs> it's sort of whatever is reinforcing, that's cool. But you can kind of see what you're, you're finding with the graphs, that not really shocking. So if you measure how many pages per day people wrote across all the weeks of the trial. First, you sort of see, if anyone does, here does intervention research, you see that truly there is no intervention you can do where people will not freaking comply, <laughs> right? I mean, you take these people who aren't writing, you tell them not to write, and they're writing like a quarter of a page a day now. <laughs> yeah. Truly professors are sort of like an irascible and stubborn contrarian bunch. But anyways, it's strange, but the spontaneous group, a little more than half a page, but really this group is just doing extremely well, like three pages. Like you could, I mean, writing a little bit every day and maybe putting a little skin in the game with some sort of reward is a huge effect. The coolest part though, I think, 
Because this, I mean, this is a nice demonstration that we should not wait to feel like it and that we can force ourselves to do these things. The coolest part, though, is what people often fear these kinds of things. They fear that whatever creative muses they have are going to get kind of like quashed or strangled by this essentially heartless, depersonalized, mechanistic approach to writing. And so they also kept idea logs and had to write down ideas for writing. So these would be ideas for what they're working on, for other projects primarily, ideas for grant proposals. And what you see is this is the number of days that elapsed between what they thought is a good idea for a writing project or a grant. And so what you see is the people who are writing the most, a little bit every day, are also having the most ideas for other projects. And this, well, it doesn't entirely fit this romanticist idea of creativity as this wacky thing that strikes you erratically. It does fit everything we know about this writing to learn approach to writing, that writing is a way of figuring out what you know, and that writing is a way of generating ideas. And as someone who's gotten gazillions in grants once told me, once asked me when I was starting out, like, how do you come up with ideas for a grant? She's like, well, you come up with an idea for a grant because you write another grant. And that grant gives you an idea for that grant. I'm like, that sounds like crazy talk. But it's true. Like, writing comes up with ideas for writing. And that, incidentally, is one reason why writing is always hard. Because the more you write, the more ideas you have, the bigger your backlog. But it's a good problem to have, I guess. So beyond this, I think in some ways, if there's really any message to take away, it would be the slow and steady approach to writing. Try to make a schedule, try to stick to it, habitualize your writing, make it kind of mundane and ordinary. But there are lots of other things you can do to sort of support and sustain it. And the one that I would suggest is to keep track of your writing. It sounds slightly creepy, and I feel like a little dorky talking about it, but I think people in the health sciences, this all sort of sounds very familiar. So whenever people are trying to change a behavior or start a new behavior, something that seems kind of unnatural, like the world's oldest kind of psychosocial intervention is to have people keep track of what they're doing on a simple little diary, a simple little log, it's a way of encouraging compliance with what you want them to do. Mostly, it's a way of showing people what they're doing, because most people have no idea what they're doing. And we know from quite a lot of research that for a lot of things, merely giving people feedback about what they're doing, now there's people interested in personalized normative feedback here and other kinds of things, like merely giving people feedback about what they're doing often just sets people straight. Like I, um, I have a friend who does uh, pastoral counseling, so he works, he's primarily that works with people who are committing to get married, and they'll meet with them for a few times just to meet with, you know, get a sort of sense of seriousness and see where they're at. And what he will do in the first week is say, okay, here's what I would like you to do. I would like you to keep track of how many times you say something nice to your partner and kiss your partner. Don't try to do it more or less, just keep track. And people are like, oh, I don't need to do that, Father. We, you know, we, we love each other. But then, you know, they do this for a couple days, and they're like, I'm going to be the worst husband ever. <laughs> I've been neglecting you. Um, it's like you want to see how much money you're spending. If, has anyone ever done this, like tracked everything you spent to the cent? And usually it takes about, like, 75 minutes, 90 minutes, where you're like, oh, my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not destitute living in the street under a box? Um, it is one of these things. It's very popular, you know, smoking cessation, weight loss. Just tracking it, non-judgmental tracking alone, fixes a lot of things. In part because it reinforces the goal, it gives people feedback. So you could do this with your writing too. So if you've got, if you're trying to work on a schedule, if you're trying to work on a schedule, you thought, okay, these are the weekdays when I'm going to write. Cool. Not the weekends, the weekdays, because you know we want to have a life, right? So here are the weekdays I'm going to write. You can just keep a little calendar, like, did I write that day or not? Yes or no? If it's yes, the smiley face. If it's no, the frowny face. I went once into an educational supply store looking for frowny faces, and they did not sell them. <laughs> Because such is the nature of feel-good, coddling education in America today. You know, you can take this to some horribly absurd level of overthinking. 
I like to use SPSS for this. <laughs> um, just to sort of overshare, I can, I can email Holly the blank files if you'd like to try this. In addition to having an input file, I also have a syntax, syntax file that will compute statistics on things. To get a sense of just like how far this has gone, those in the front can see that this is row 2,558. Um, <laughs> this goes back, I believe, to about 2005 or 2004. And yeah, this is really all I do. I just like month, date, day of the week. Sometimes I'll count how many words I write. I don't do that so much anymore. Really what I'm interested in is met or unmet. So you don't put the, the time or the hours? You can. I um, actually know people who do this. Like they'll keep track in kind of 15 minute blocks, like how long they spent. I know a lot of people who set word goals, like I want to write 250 words today and things like that. I think you can take it actually in all kinds of fun and nerdy and overly quantitative directions <laughs> that sort of appeal to us. Yes? Just a question. I mean, we keep talking about writing, but mm -hmm. is it actually sitting down with the mm. writing or are you looking at putting together things, going back? Yeah. And forth? That is a good question because actually I tend to view writing in a very um, expansive way. Because my, my worldview on this is it's hard to find time to say, for example, write that one page of specific games to go from no words to a page of words. Mm -hmm. But it's also a hard time to find find the time to read the grant guidelines, to talk to a program officer, to read literature, to do data analysis. So for me, this writing time is everything. Like a lot of it is spent reading, uh, analyzing data, because I kind of think of it as like, there's not time for that either. Like once the day starts, it's just there and everything is gone. So for me, it all counts. I have some friends who feel that this is a very subtle form of procrastination. It lets them off the hook. And I think you sort of can just trust your own self insight on this. So a good friend of mine, he's like, I have to write 250 words every day. It's like, well, what about, you know, you send something to a journal, and the journal sends it back. And they're like, we love it, but we would love it so much more if it was like 70% shorter. <laughs> he's like, I still got to get 250 words on something that day. So some, because he just feels he's letting himself off a hook. But for me, he doesn't have kids. His hook is not quite as big, and I'm just like, I got to move this project forward. So my sense is if it's moving a manuscript towards submission to a journal or a grant proposal towards submission to a sponsor, that's cool. Like that's writing for me because like all that stuff has to happen sometime. So and I think that, that food for thought, that's just food for thought. People can kind of pick a spot. So yeah, this is, um, you could try this if you like. I will just confess um, it ain't all Mets like last December there was last month with some grim and dark unmets. I'm not sure what was going on. Um, I was working on the same paper. This was the, the first draft of a paper. This was the revision of the paper. Yeah, those Fridays sort of sucked. <laughs> but I don't keep track of why I did or didn't. It's OK. I just think of it, you did or you didn't, yes or no, take the lumps. That's cool. It is what it is. Like, so food for thought. So for this part, really, I think to sort of wrap it up, it, it's awkward and unnatural for us to think about writing as like a smooth and evened out way. And we've really written off huge chunks of the semester, right? The first week of class, most people don't even try. Last week of class, we don't try. Finals week, we don't try. That week before spring break, not trying, because you'll get a lot more done in spring break. It's just, it's just more, it's just efficiency, really. It's common sense. And so much of the semester, we just simply forsake, right? Looking for more utopic times that are sort of not there. And this is why I think the slow and steady approach is gonna help. Writing becomes habitual. You're not forcing yourself to do it. And perversely, people will start to write basically the same amount every week of the semester. First week of class, it's like the last week of class, it's like the third week of class. The week before spring break is like any other week. And then when spring break comes, take a break. Enjoy it with the kids. It's okay. So that's 
most all I would have to say about this, and perhaps any questions before we jump to a break? A good question. I don't. Um, a few people have suggested that I try a boy style intervention study of sorts. Um, there's a large lore on this in the world of creative writing because essentially all creative writers have always worked this way simply because they, they have to produce. And they tend to have the most hard nosed and least romanticized views of what writing is like where they focus on practice, they focus on training, they focus on working with mentors, and they focus on hours and routine. There's actually a very cool book called, um, called Writing and Flow by Susan Perry. She, she was a graduate student of Mahali, Sixth, Mahali, however you say that guy's name. And she interviewed about 70 writers, like all of whom are extremely famous, like poet laureates of the United States, National Book Award winners, um, authors of pot boiler crime fiction, like Jonathan Kellerman was in there. Faye Kellerman was in there too, which is weird. Michael Connolly was in there. And she is interested in how do they get into this creative flow state for writing, where they feel what their writing is good. And they all say, well, they, they have creepy habits, like creepy, scary, rigid habits, in a way that to outsiders seems almost superstitious. But what these habits do is they let them write the amount they need to write. But primarily what it does is when the habit is strong, it's easier to slip into a more absorbed state for writing because so much else is, is being controlled in the environment. And your mind, because you have the strong habit, it's not anticipating anything coming up. Like your habitual mind is saying, it's time to write. I'm not thinking about grading, not thinking about other things, because we're not going to do that anyway. So the, the weirdest example might be Cormac McCarthy, who that came out a couple of years ago, you know, this great novelist, that everything he's ever written, down to the, the last fan letter and all of his novels, short stories, was written on this typewriter, this travel typewriter. So starting in like the mid-60s, up until about 2009, he used the same typewriter, and he would get it repaired. <laughs> And he would hose it, hose it down, which is strange. Um, and that was it. And it broke, finally, beyond repair. And so he donated it to an auction where it fetched over six figures. And then he did what all hardcore writers will do and those in need of research equipment, is he went to eBay and he got one just like it <laughs> for $16. <laughs> Sweet. So now, I, like, now a lot of budding creative writers, they take the wrong message away, which is, I should get a typewriter. Or Stephen King's really into writing longhand. I'll do that. Or oh, this person's really into scented candles. I'll do that. And they're forgetting that the point's not exactly what they're up to. It's that they're doing the same thing every day, that there's this routine and regularity. So they're not trying to find the time anymore. They're not trying to force themselves to write anymore. It's just a sort of a something that's happening. But a lot of people talk to me about the book and sort of writing schedules. A lot of people do it. Where I work, it's sort of caught on in large part because we also have some writing groups that we'll talk about later of people kind of get into it. And once people get into it, if you can stick it out for about four weeks, it's very helpful because mostly first people will finish the thing hanging over their head. Then they're like, crap, there's like a big backlog of stuff after that. <laughs> but you finish some of that. I think people start to feel a little bit better about their writing because it's more routine and more regular. It's less stressful because you're not trying to always looking for time. Your weekends kind of become your own again, which is when most people sort of start to do this kind of stuff. So I think a lot of people, I mean, quite a lot of people have told me that they're not really writing much more than they used to, but it's a lot less stressful and they kind of feel more controlled about it and it's less boom or bust. It's just part of the job a little bit more. And that's nice to hear, because I actually think what you often hear is people say, I really need to make writing a priority. It needs to be the most important thing. But, but it really doesn't. And I think in some ways it sort of shouldn't. Like there's a lot of things that are important, even our professional life. Like writing's kind of key, because that's the mechanism of getting our work out there. But 
I don't think we'd really want to look back on our lives and say that we made our scholarly writing like the most important thing and the biggest priority. Because even in our careers, there, there's service and stewardship and mentorship and other things that you know, we, we could hope oh, as things emerge, like this sort of becomes more important too. So if you give it a try, certainly email me and let me know how's it going. I'm always actually very curious. You know, Robert yes. Boyce has the book Advice for New Faculty. Yeah, members. it's a good so book. If you're yeah. New faculty, I'd strongly recommend you get it. Oh yeah, it's great. We yeah. Had a great team. Uh, they're a husband and wife, and now they're at Cornell. But every new faculty member that got hired at UTEP got a book. Mm -hmm. and when they left, those books stopped. And I, I think so. Now we have entire cohorts who never got that advice mm -hmm. with moderation, mm -hmm. with service, with teaching, with writing, and mm -hmm. it's uh, advice for new faculty members. And it's a good book. Boyce. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, because there what he does is he, he extends his message of try to write for 20 minutes a day to work on lectures in 20 minute blocks, service, other kinds of things that don't, don't go in big crazy binges on everything. Just try to spread it out, use the time that you have. And yet people Easy does resist it. it. Mm -hmm. People hate, they, they have a love-hate relationship with the book. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, why? We're trying to be grad students. We're trying to finish. We're trying, you're telling us to mellow out. Mm -hmm. So they, I think... Internally it seems okay. unnatural. Yeah. Kind of, you know, issues yep. with that. Mm -hmm. I would just say, and I guess we'll go to break, I think it, it, it's social learning and role modeling like we see in, in, in public health and community health that we've seen advisors and successful professors work this way at the last freak of minute at deadlines, and we just think this is how it goes. And not that anyone here would do this, of course. Just, <laughs> but anyways, so yes, yeah, so let's take a break. Um, let's. Let's mob the eggs and coffee. <laughs> I'm not sure what time it is, but perhaps.